So um, one thing is that I know Alex is also going to give a talk on something similar, so I'm not sure. We didn't coordinate this. So, But I, for the reason to kind of keep the area open for Alex to present more of a technical details, I'm going to go more into a little bit of uh, what we have been doing over the last actually maybe eight, nine years and how we were moving through these different variations and why we were developing them. And toward then I'm going to basically focus a little more on to this last kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, algorithms that are looking at um, reaching the uh, linear rate, which was the uh, work that was collaborated with our postdoc, Wilbur Shi uh, and uh, Alex. And Wilbur was um, basically, he had a, a little, as a student, he collaborated with Watao. So basically he has a couple contributions into this distributed uh, framework for optimization. And I'm going to mention also some of those. So I'm not going to go too much into trying to motivate because uh, this for our crowd, we are pretty much comfortable with saying we won't like to solve distributed problems for different reasons and potentially applications that are perceived in the future due to the sensing capabilities, basically, we have these days. And uh, one of the new topics that is kind of emerging, we persistently see these new buzzwords coming, and one of the new ones is, this, they call it I of T, which is Internet of Things, which kind of, we all kind of can imagine what it is, but we don't know yet how it's going to look like when it comes to actually putting these things together. So that's some of, I think it's one of the challenges that NSF is these days very much advertising. And what happens in these situations when you're, basically what you have is a system in which information is kind of local to different units, whether they are computers, they are sensors, they are different perhaps um, um, subsystems that have their own little capacity to compute, to sense and, and process and communicate information. Then what happens is, in principle, applications come from now, you, if you can look at the scope of problems that are varying from estimation, detection, um, you have a learning uh, kind of uh, processes going on in signal processing, in communication, and in the data processing, it has its own little uh, whole uh, array of problems in that space. Uh, there are on the type of optimization, when you think of if you want to run this system optimally, you usually have uh, some objective that you want to kind of achieve or optimize. And in that case, there are various sub-problems that come with resource allocation flavor or even in control. When you have one to control like the other day, uh, yesterday, Mike was talking about uh, running the robotic sensors. So the, what comes, I will focus really on optimization side because that's where, that's where I'm coming from. So the, in principle, when we look at these problems, if you put the formulation itself, and we'll see it a little bit, a few slides down the road. Uh, problem itself is not new to optimization uh, kind of literature. What is new is that constraints that you see or information pieces are really not available at one location. And, and basically, the new part and new challenge for the optimizers come from understanding that I don't have access to the all, every every function I need to minimize. I don't have access to the whole problem. And the curse is basically how do we deal with this problem when different pieces of the problem are known to different entities. And in that respect, now the other lay of questions like Vaide uh, uh, was just talking, you can talk about uh, you know, security, privacy, how do you hide? I'm not touching that, I'm more focusing on uh, what kind of algorithms we have developed and what kind of different challenges we were uh, kind of facing with each one of the developments. So the, it all started by putting actually together ideas from the consensus literature and optimization. Because in the consensus, they, know, they have methodology of how would you, given a system of, uh, given a network of different nodes, and each one has its own Number, for example, how do you aggregate the data by using local connectivity to produce one aggregate on which they all agree? Sometimes it's the average of the values they have, sometimes it's a different, but you want the whole system to whichever node you pick, it will spit the same number after some number, after certain alg algorithm is performed inside the, the network. 
And the literature is huge, meaning many of us had worked on this problem independently of putting optimization in the context of that. So a kind of consensus problem can be formulated as actually a feasibility problem. And it's going to become in a second clear. But more general problem you can kind of cast in that in a, in a system is consider a system in which now you have nodes that have individual objective functions, f1 at node 1, f2 at node 2, and so, so on. And imagine they are connected in undirected graph for time being. I'm not going to consider a case when you have constraints. We can do that, but I want to focus on, on, I, on basic ideas in principle. And you want to minimize the sum of the objective functions subject to you know, x being a vector with the constraint that only fi, function fi, is only known to agent i. And that's the only constraint. Aside from that, we'll assume that the graph is connected. And for the e easiness of exposure, we'll assume that each function is convex and differentiable. In many of these approaches, you don't need a, every piece of the function, every fi to be convex. You need the sum to be convex. And that's exactly as uh, Vaidya had it um, in his but for time being, I'm going to just assume it. It's maybe, in some cases, it's more than we needed. So a couple algorithms that we considered in that respect was, were basically very simple. First, first one is basically saying that if I connect with my neighbors and I put weights AIJ to the information that comes from my neighbor, basically, in this concept, of, uh, each of us have an estimate, so at time t, Agent I has estimate xi of t, and the neighbors have xj of t. Aij is equal to 0 if node j is not a neighbor of the agent i. So with Aij, you can con actually um, encode the graph structure. And the weight Aij is positive if xj is your neighbor. And in, what else we require here is this is one of the basic, uh, on the basic algorithms is that summation of these AIJs is equal to 1. So very basically what you're doing, you're convexly combined, combining estimates that are coming from the neighbors. Upon doing that, you're basically trying to align. So the first uh, term there is kind of we try to align our decision with the neighbors. Second one is saying I'm going to take a step following my uh, own gradient at my current state, which is xi of t if I'm agent i. There is a variant, so in this variant first one, you are just basically aggregating the decisions of the gradients are come on, coming kind of uh, at, a, at a computed at the current state prior to the averaging, right? There is a variant where you can first aggregate the information on the, on the states and then also use that for the evaluation of the gradient. Those are slight variations in the, in the second part here. The, the first and the second equation differ only in where I'm evaluating the gradient. So under certain nice assumptions, let's say on the step size, if step size is diminishing and it satisfies this uh, sum of the, uh, that sum of the step sizes is not, uh, it's actually plus infinity, but the squares are summable, you can show that uh, if the problem has a solution, if the matrix A that you are using is doubly stochastic, and there are some assumptions on the gradients. You can prove that uh, iterates at every of the agents will converge to some of the solutions of the problem because you may have more than one. And there, is a, there are results when we can characterize this rate. In the most general case, when the gradients are only bounded, you can get something like an ln of t over square root of t. And if the functions are in the sum of them is strongly convex, you can improve it to just improving the factor here by square root. And ln of t kind of got to hunt us from, um, from the graph. So the one part to kind of carry from here is that this is a very, it was the simplest possible thing we could think of. Just kind of combining the two. And uh, one way to winning, there is a connection between this and some regularization. But in principle, um, this, there is a lot of work that I'm going to probably go for faster through this. But what is happening here, that algorithm is kind of slow. If you know that if I, if I don't have strong convexity, algorithm goes with the ln of t over square root of t. That's really slow. But the uh, slowliness is also allowing, you can, you can easily extend this to time varying graphs. You just need to worry about something about these matrices and the underlying graphs. That should be some structure in them. 
But in principle, because it's slow, it can catch up with a lot of in, uh, imprecisions in computations. You can, uh, with a lot of basically errors, whether they are coming from the, from the wrong, uh, from a kind of gradient uh, estimates that might be even stochastic. You can even play with the variance that um, noisy links may happen. But in principle, because it's slow, it can catch up with a lot of changes. That's the bottom line. But the downside is it's, it's kind of slow. And another thing what was where I'm going, when one of the drawbacks was uh, first noted was that, well, the way it's given, you need double stochastic matrices for the things to work, right? And often, well, if you have a directed graph, you have a problem. Because construction on directed graph, if it's static, there is a process. You can construct it on the go. And I think uh, there is a recent paper with us, and I may not remember who else was working on it, when they can, on a static directed graph, they have a way of adjusting the weights in a such way that in the limit, asymptotically, they are, they are uh, creating double stochastic matrices and solving the problem. But uh, here, if you, once you allow the graphs to change, then, oh yeah, then you cannot do that. Because by the time you construct double stoch uh, stochastic weights for this particular graph, it takes time. And you need to take a gradient. And then the next time unit, you're going to face a different graph. You need to construct the weights again. So in order to avoid that kind of double process, which takes a lot of some iterations to do the weights and then move in the gradient space, with Alex, we actually resorted to something that was, um, what you do is you resort to a different form of consensus algorithm. So if you look at literature out there, there was a paper by Kempe, Dobra, and Gerke, where actually they have an um, algorithm for reaching agreement on a directed graphs. It was given for some kind of random gossiping, I believe, but the idea extends beyond their uh, initial work. So you can expand it to deterministically, let's say, changing uh, directed graphs. And the idea hides behind using, in essence, using row stochastic matrices, which are easy to construct because they depend on knowing your outgoing links, which is sort of in the directed graphs, we kind of assume that we know with whom we can talk down the stream. And, uh, and then basically forming a ratio. So the idea is relatively simple, but then equations become a little bit messier. So what I, uh, here the notion says that if the, what I have is that in the absence of double stochasticity, we have a, basically some different problem that we are solving. And we resort to the basically version, we call it push sum because, or actually push sub gradient or gradient, because push sum is the underlying a consensus uh, mechanism. And when the graph is kind of static, what happens is that if the matrix, if the matrix A, you think of the matrix A as basically um, a row st a column stochastic matrix that obeys the structure of the graph. What I mean by that is that weight will be positive if the link AIJ is positive, if the link, directed link IJ exists and will be Zero otherwise. And then if you, under uh, assumptions on the, um, basically that the graph is strongly connected, this power of the matrices, A to the power of T, have a limit when the, when the graph is nice. And it's uh, basically a matrix which has what all rows or columns are all the same and uh, correspond to a pi vector is a unit vector. It's normalized, positive value, so it gives you like a, a steady state distribution of, a, of a, a form of a chain. And then a simple observation is that imagine running this process, a linear process driven by matrix A, starting with some initial point x0. Then because the matrices converge, you can easily show that limit of such uh, process, uh, what I mean here in x, I have scalars, and xi value corresponds to uh, node i. So if I put them all in a, stack them in a vector and apply this dynamic, then in the limit, each of these coordinates will actually converge to, the, uh, to, this, uh, to this vector at the end. So what's the, uh, what the vector is, 
it's actually a scaling of this vector pi, the steady state vector. That's actually like bias, if you want, in the distribution on the final uh, steady states of the, of, the, of the chain. And if you repeat the process with now, let's say you run a different process, which is actually the same, you just change the initial point from y, from instead of x, I call it y0 and run another process with the same dynamic, then the limit should be the same. It's just um, scaling times the vector pi. When the scaling in first case with x's and the y's is really summation of the initial values. So it's the, the, the scaling fact, scaling of the two processes just differs in the initial conditions. And that gives a simple idea of what they call a ratio consensus. If you form for every coordinate ratio between xi and yi, then what you see, it's relatively simple that in the limit, the, uh, the component pi i of the vectors, the basically occupancy at the limit of the state i, is going to cancel. They are positive numbers in this case. And what remains is just the ratio of the sum of the initial conditions. And now if you want to have any, let's say you want this number to be initial, initial average, all it requires is that y process should be such that this sum of these initial vectors is really equal to n. And one of the conditions, meaning one simple way to do it is to actually require that the agents start initially y, all start with state one. Then you're going to have here basically as a direct kind of consequence of the choice of that, you're going to get that each of these coordinates of the ratio process is indeed converging to the uh, average of the initial values in x. Now, that's simple in the first, when you think about in terms of number, uh, just the scalar and uh, uh, ratio of the two. And in principle, that's really what's done in the analysis. When we, what I want to say is even when you look more complicated, this is really behind what was... Uh, behind the, the algorithm when it goes in the analysis with complexities if you start moving, if you change this matrix and you allow it to be time varying, you run into some other issues, but in principle, that's it. This is the key. Um, and then let me skip through this and this and this and this and let me be here. So this is how the push sum works. The first uh, term is basically mimicking what what, I'm, what I have here, three variables, but the wi correspond to the first case of x's, actually. Um, and note here that instead of this matrix A, we have, if the graph is time varying, we have just weights that are particularly selected depending on the graph structure. So this 1 over dj of t plus 1 is really the weight that's going to sit um, in the place of aij. And it's time varying. dj would be the number of outgoing links for the agent is that? that's agent j agent j when it sends its estimate it sends it scaled by the number of its outgoing links and one more because it counts itself so you can think of this is really that one over dj one plus t is just particular choice of the matrix a that corresponds to the graph at time t okay so the yi is exactly, if you recall, yi follows the, the dynamic of this. Uh, yi is in principle something that's going to be started at zero and it's going to be used to be used in the ratio to divide. So this is in following the same dynamic as the prior one in terms of just the variable yj. yj is a scalar. x is a vector. And now from what you've seen that ratio of this variable yi and y, uh, uh, wy and why I have actually things that are converging to consensus, we form it here only because when we compute the gradients in the next place, we want the gradients computed. That's the point at which we are computing it. So extra variable comes because we need to, if I want to solve the optimization problem, I'm going to use basically update of the variable xi will be kind of average of a different kind of the uh, estimates that came from the agent uh, from my neighbors and this is the gradient step that's going to just be evaluated 
at the point of what we know, believe, what we know is going to, if everything is good, should go to a consensual decision vector. And then analysis is a little bit messier. But uh, in principle, we really follow that insight, what, what happens when you just mix simple scalar numbers. And what you end up uh, a little bit kind of heavier because we have to bounce certain things from zero away. But in reality, uh, analysis is kind of following just uh, the first couple of slides I showed you. And then one can show that under assumptions similar, because these assumptions are typical even if you had a, a generic static optimization problem in which maybe the gradients have errors, then the step size usually have to follow these two rules in order to uh, guarantee any form of convergence. And um, we also have, a, with Alex, we worked on the rate results. We, they parallel what we have seen for the Basically, you can get ln of t over square root of t if the functions are just convex. And if I assume some kind of strong convexity, you're going to get just, again, improvement in this term that divides ln of t, just one square root factor better. So that was a kind of attempt to pass the curse of the, if we have directions and we cannot construct doubly stochastic matrices. And then past that, Few, I don't know how long after that, there was a uh, work uh, with um, Wei, Shi, Ling, Wu, and Wu Tao. They came up with extra in about what, 2014, 2015. What they kind of looked at is, say, we want to use this algorithm that I just showed you, let's say in the case when the matrices are doubly stochastic, the one that's easier. They just do some averaging. Uh, that doesn't, that's simple kind of mixing with the doubly stochastic matrices. What they know, observe is that um, if you want to fix the step size to be constant, so if, I, if, I, if I'm not allowed to use a diminishing step size, then in the basically, if, and if the process is convergent, then if you imagine just x size and xj is there as time goes to infinity, converge to some point, then you get to some kind of equation from which it follows that the gradient of each of these components function has to be zero at that point. What it means is that if I want to use this algorithm with a fixed step size, the only way that's going to solve the problem correctly is it will happen if all the component functions have some common minima. But then it's a bit, mm, meaning in a sense, let's say if they're all strongly convex, then why would they even do any combination, maybe each of them can find their own minima independently, because in this case, it means that they all have the same minima. So what it basically says is that you cannot use that algorithm with a fixed step size. And by doing that, does something which is much worse to us. If I'm thinking now, OK, suppose I have a, um, a problem in which functions are nice, differentiable with Lipschitz, proper, Lipschitz gradients, and they are strongly convex, I have no way of achieving linear rate. Because linear rate, even if, when the problem is static, will happen only when the step size is sort of fixed. It has to fall within certain range, but with the diminishing step size, we are not going to re reach the linear rate. Linear, I mean geometric decay in the, by the dis uh, distance from the optimum set. Or in, a fun or in a function values. So this is the biggest thing. Because after th doing this, we started looking at how can we uh, get this algorithm to be fast. And this was an in indication that we cannot do it. To this class of algorithms, no chance. So what is the problem? So what do we do is like, OK, let's go back to the original problem and see what are we doing really. So this is the problem we want to solve. Once you have a distributed uh, structure in the problem, you are reformulating it by constructing local copies, right? For each agent, I'm going to formally change the decision variable x by xi, and then force that all of xi's are the same as for all of them. By using the structure of the graph, if, let's say underlying graph is static, it's undirected, and it's connected, then you can, instead of having these all pairs equal, you can equivalently capture this um, kind of agreement constraint 
by just looking, by actually imposing that for every agent, he needs to agree with its neighbors. That's what this would be. So I'm just reducing the number of equations that I'm using to describe the, the, the constraint set. And uh, at the moment, uh, set ni is really the set of neighbors uh, in whatever graph is given. And now, if you think from, let's say, functions are nicely, con uh, strongly convex, they may have a, a differentiable, uh, not just differentiable, but Lipschitz gradients, then what one can do is you can, from this problem, the only thing you, need, you can employ, there are some primal dual techniques or um, kind of ADMM techniques. The only thing what's, they exist in the literature, but the only thing that remains in order to bring them to this universe is to see whether their implementation will obey with the local structure of the problem. And if not, you may devise, you may devise them, you may kind of expand them. And there has been, uh, actually, and then when the problem is centralized, we know that we should have a, a linear rate on this problem. On, on the best rate should be linear under these good conditions on the problem, pro on the function properties. But, um, and there actually, so that would be, uh, so the problem is only whether we can really implement it in the distributed setting and get these rates out. And it's, uh, there is a work that actually Wotau has this in extra and PG extra. They have actually um, shown that they ha there is a linear rate that can be, this algorithm can, uh, very, their algorithm would achieve a linear rate on these kind of problems. And uh, I think Ermin has here the different somewhat work. It's in asynchronous settings, so the rates are different. But in principle, the reason is that trouble with all of these algorithms work well and they can achieve good rate, but you have to have a graph static. And I think that was where Ermin was, first attempt was trying to basically look at what if happens if the graph is not static. And in this case, there, are some, there is a possibility to handle asynchronous graphs, graphs that are coming randomly with a particular distribution. So the remaining question that actually Alex was after is saying, can we do the rate while the graphs are changing? And that led to something a bit different. But here, I mean, conceptually, meaning what's the difference between one problem and the other? It's funny because it's kind of you're facing the same problem, but what is given to you is different, okay? So original problem you want to solve is that one, right? The first line, regardless of what graph is given to you, this is what you want to do. You want to have a solution at which all the x variables are the same, pairwise. Now, if the graph is different, let's say when the, if the graphs are changing, so what is mean by that changing here? It's a bit confusing because um, the, my problem is static. There is no time there. But I'm thinking when I start solving the problem, there will be in this some in time index k, and at different instances of k, I may be facing different graphs. So this is what the G sequence, let's say kind of somebody already told you at which instances you will be computing and, there are, and may even give you this sequence beforehand or at the time when you are up, up to update. So what changes in the problem is the only thing is that you now want these pairs to coincide for every agent i and those j's that are in the neighborhood that are changing. So where is that, uh, what is that now? The, the, difference, the difference is if you think constraint set is the same. That's the first line. The only difference is that at time k, the agents will get a different description, local description of some constraints that if they are aggregated, they are bringing, bringing us. So basically, the problem constraint had different description at different time instances k. In principle, it's the same constraint, but algebraic, uh, what we give to the agent algebraically is different. And this is uh, kind of, this gives hope that we might be doing, we might be able to do it in a linear rate. But it comes with an extension. Extension says that if you think of agents, in the first case, they were only aware of the neighbors and exchanging the decisions. Now, if you make them aware that they are part of a system, 
that also has each of these agents have objectives, then you might think of why don't they track the gradients as well? Because they are aware that these other guys are also doing optimization. And they're part of the overall uh, optimization for the system. What it suggests is instead of taking your selfish gradient that just worries about your cost function, why are you not using something that mimics or tracks the average of the gradients in the system? And you can do it because you can do, with local averaging, you can, you can kind of reach the uh, kind of what is system average. In terms of the decisions, you should be able to reach the same in terms of the gradients. And because they are time changing, you're really tracking them. So that tracking is basically re realized by having here some variable that is your kind of, some kind of guess what you have about what the sum of the gradients of the other agents were. That's not, shouldn't be Z, but it should be XJs. Fi is there. But, and you have to update it uh, at an, uh, after this uh, updating the states by basically taking the prior estimate uh, uh, sorry, upgrading with the G, uh, this, with surrogates that you're going to receive from the neighbors, and also correct it by removing your prior contribution and adding new term in. It's basically like innovation term. That people who do filtering they do this often. You want to remove what you have already contributed and bring only no new part in. If you don't do that, so what happens under under double stochastic matrices? You can show that. Some of these GEIs across the system are actually always tracking the sum of the gradients. And that's, that's one of the reasons why you subtract. Otherwise, you're going to aggregate. It's going to explode. So to kind of uh, give you here, there are a lot, meaning this idea of tracking can be found in uh, several papers that actually Usman's work was also doing. It just with a different way of tracking. It was kind of combining portion of poor sum and the row, row stochastic matrices, I believe. And then cl the closest actually to what we are talking here, but in the universe of non-convex problem is done by Lorenzo and Aldo, and the algorithm they call it next. What they actually have, it's more general because they realize that, let's say we want to solve non-convex problem when functions are non-convex, then instead of using the gradients of the functions fi, you can use the uh, gradients of the linearizations of the functions, where the, these are basically you can think of any convex function whose linearization, first order of, of uh, linearization in the function value and the gradients are coinciding with your function f in, in here individually. Then you can actually show that this algorithm exhibits. Uh, under some specific step size choices, you can show it ex uh, exhibits convergence toward the stationary points of the original problem. But uh, you know, the only, we basically came to this that, uh, so Allo has a very general scheme driven by attempt to come with actually, it's a class of algorithms and it attacks the non convex problems. We came from a corner looking on convex problems, solely worried about the rate. And it turns out that you, this, uh, actually in their papers, you have a lot of kind of details, and Aldo will probably talk about them. And I'm going to say just, I'm going to very much have to rush up, but I'm going to go to the fact that uh, we have a result that I want to go into that detail that we can get a geometric rate, a linear rate, but it's not pretty. And let's, let's go into what assumptions do we need in this case of this uh, algorithm that tracks the gradients? Uh, Wilbur call it digging to stand for distributed inexact gradient and ING borrowed from tracking. He loves to give names to the things. So we assumed here that our functions are convex with Lipschitz gradients and constant is Li for the function of I. Um, we have the sum of these functions to be strongly convex. We don't need individual functions to be strongly convex. And the graphs here, we assume that they are, I'm looking at a case when the graph is undirected and uh, time varying. And uh, uh, we kind of, with this, we assume that the graphs don't have to be instantaneously connected. You can just simply 
set this B to be one and think they're all connected every time you get it. This is just a stretch we can do. So B is just some delayed uh, number of times I need to take the graphs, overlay them, and then guarantee that overlaid graph is the links. It will give me a connected graph. The matrices have to be doubly stochastic in case I'm, doing, uh, I'm dealing with an undirected graph. And the same compatibility at time k, the matrix has to be compatible with the graph in terms of if, the j, if i and j are neighbors, then that value has to be bounded away from 0. Um, otherwise, wij is 0 if i and j are not neighbors. And then we have this, this kind of very nasty expression about what we are after the rate. Uh, uh, it's a linear rate with the parameter lambda. Well, lambda has a very nasty expression. It involves, it involves a lot of constants that basically one can say it's a theoretical result. One can basically shows, yes, there is a linear rate. But if somebody asks you to compute this rate, meaning to find the lambda, it's a pretty, you have a lot of, you need to know a lot about the, let's say, the graphs to be able to come up with the step size lambda. Well, meaning to come up with what, what should be parameters in step size is actually alpha. And that's the range that is telling you. If alpha ha falls in that range, then my rate lambda, the, the, it's the coefficient that drives the geometric rate. So lambda to the power of k is the decay rate. It's given there, but the step size is depending on a lot of parameters that it's absolutely hard to compute. So we have experiments, but in these experiments, the step size was hand-tuned. Um, one thing that we haven't done and may have been uh, doable is to, let's say, um, re re uh, restrict yourself to a certain class of graphs, perhaps deregular, and then see if any of these constants can become something meaningful. We haven't done that. We had looked at just general graphs under this assumption that, let's say, they are B units connected and then and that the lower bound on the entries is tau. So that, meaning the rates seem to be uh, plausible in which, ex in which sense because the ranges and the step size do depend on the graph structure, do depend on uh, kappa bar, which is like a, um, what I call it, like a, um, condition number of the problem. It's a ratio of the maximum of the Lipschitz values for the gradients and uh, uh, the strong convexity constant. So all the parameters are showing except it's hard to compute. So you can think of them as um, just existence result. We have extension. How would you do that if, if the graphs are directed? And uh, I'm not going to go with that. But more details on this we have in the... Oof, Actually, it's an archive, but I, I think it's already accepted and uh, something that we try to decouple because if in the, in the original work, we, sh we use the step size for the same, uh, same for every agent. So we try to, um, Wilbur was interested in looking at, is it possible to allow them to independently select alpha i? It's doable, but yes, they still have a common, certain things that they have to commonly know in order to do it. So it's not totally decentralized. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop at that because I'm thinking um, I'm running out of time. Yes? So uh, a lot of these results assume the size of the graph is finite. And yes. And the, the asymptotics or uh, decay rate is Yes. Uh, are there results studying the asymptotics in terms of graph size? Yes, actually, the, uh, in this, okay. So let me say it as it is. Uh, I think uh, in in this in this one here, I don't have explicit. Eh, let's say in some places it shows up. Here it has some constant that scales with square root of m. M is the, the number of nodes. But there are hidden constants in delta that also depend on the size. 
Uh, there is one case, and maybe Alex will mention that more tomorrow. We have looked at a very specialized case when you might use, on you know, an undirected graph, the matrices W that are using a special, they have lazy metropolis structure. Then you can kind of uh, have a nicer expression for the step size, but it has a not so favorable dependence on the M, like uh, 4.5. So the reason is that, okay, in many of these cases, it's really graph dependent. And dependence on M could be very, very bad. This is a polynomial, but it's not necessarily a great number because if M is huge, that's a huge number. So there could be additional research that if one wants to look and say, okay, can we keep it, is it there a way we can keep it of the order of, I don't know, square root of M, log of M, I have no idea. But this is the closest we got to that, that you know, can we just get a constant to get M out? Right. But we don't know it for the directed graphs. It's only on, the, on these guys. Any other questions? I think we can wrap up, go to lunch. Let's mm -hmm. thank the speaker again. Thank you.